Hi there. Thanks for joining. It's great to be at VIEW this year. There are so many incredible talented artists with workshops. I'm humbled to be able to share my learnings as part of the program. To clarify, this session won't be a tutorial on the VR software I use. The best I can do is kind of walk you through how, by embracing what they have to offer, XR spatial design tools have opened up new opportunities in my creative process. You know, show you examples of how I apply techniques and features to the work I do. To give you some context, I'm a multidisciplined visual storyteller and creative media executive. I've been in the media and entertainment space for some 20 odd years from advertising to film production, TV development and VR. In my previous role as VP creative for immersive entertainment at NBC Universal, I led creative innovation, strategy, narrative design, and visual development across traditional and emerging media with a focus on animation, XR, real time, and virtual production. In parallel, I've always been an independent animator, illustrator, and character designer. These days, I get hired as an independent creative consultant. I blend my executive experience with my hands-on skills as an artist to originate IP and develop entertainment franchises as well as animated stories for different formats. The proposals, pitch bibles, and ideas I develop need to be supported by visual elements. And being a visual storyteller, depending on the project, I might provide anything from story thumbnails like these to sample layouts. This is from a digital comic. Through to concept art, I do a lot of character design. And they could be done in pen and ink or watercolor or, you know, or character thumbnails or any combination of, of all of these uh, pieces of artwork. Historically, I've struggled to translate my fine art skills into computer graphics, 3D computer graphics, I should say, using traditional 3D software. And in my experience, project budgets rarely include enough for collaborations at the development stage, which is where I focus most of my creativity. So I've had to be self-sufficient as a development executive and one that visualizes alongside the story development process. And secretly, I've remained frustrated that I couldn't sense check my ideas in 3D for the brief and the vision to come. That is until I tried good spatial design apps. So over the next hour, I will focus on how two spatial design apps, Masterpiece Studio and Tavori, have made 3D design accessible for me and my explorations of integrations with non-spatial apps that help me prototype ideas further and iterate concepts quicker. So hopefully you'll get to see how originating in VR doesn't mean your output has to be VR. You can use your creations in a multitude of ways and integrate with uh, non-VR apps as well. The development art I generate has always been about selling the vision. It is seldom used in the final execution or finished production. I work with teams to get there. And as you'll see, being able to now involve many steps of the production in my mock-ups at the inception of ideas helps validate the possibilities in a richer way. It's essentially pre-pre-production art. All right, without further ado, let's get into the workflows now. I've started a new blank space in Masterpiece Creator. You can select different environments, but I'll keep it simple for now. Some people like to work without any environment at all, but I'm comfortable with at least a grid and a horizon line. That really helps me when I'm working in VR to sort of keep me oriented and avoid any sort of motion sickness. All the sculpting tools and modifiers are in the clay section. I find blocking in with these primitives is kind of in line with how I've always sketched on paper. It's got a whole painting section. I'll cover my coloring and painting process later on. I don't use the selection tools very often, but it's pretty self-explanatory. I haven't had reason yet to use the mesh tools, but I've seen other artists kit bash incredible art using this feature. The scene menu is essentially where the layers are, not just clay, but any light and cameras you might set up for your project. And the view menu lets you adjust how things look to you within this space. It doesn't carry over to anything you export though. Now this cube is an important thing to get your head around. Basically, I think of it as my 3D canvas, the boundaries within which I can sculpt and paint. And the size and position of the cube is related to the active layer. So your design can go beyond this boundary by lining up and placing layers for whatever you need to create. 
There's no hard and fast rule, for me at least. It really depends on what I intend to create, the style and purpose of the design. You know, stuff like the genre or who the audience is. Is it for look dev? Or will it be a game asset? Is it going to be a static prop or a rigged character? And then for that matter, where is that rigged character going to go? Is it going to stay in a VR workflow like going into Tavori or used in Maya? Will it even be full body? Or does it just need to be a head and shoulders bust? All of this stuff comes into play when I'm planning how best to use Masterpiece. If there is one governing principle, I guess it's about establishing major forms and the shape language I have in my head. And that shape language really comes down to the personality of the character, their role in the story, and what those shapes mean in the broader context of across the cast of characters. A single squeeze of the controller's trigger button lays down a clean shape. I can adjust the strength and size of the tool with the analog sticks. Here's a key principle of voxel sculpting. The closer you place your clay, the more the shape will merge. Think of the canvas as a Rubik's Cube-like arrangement of 3D pixels. The pros of voxel sculpting are, you know, organic forms come easily. The cons, though, are you have to be careful if you want precise, hard edges. Those take extra care and attention. Stuff like angle snapping and the grid options can help a lot. I always start with simple forms and combine them to create an overall design statement and then build details on top. So it's quite a natural fit here with these built into Masterpiece. Now I'm getting a much cleaner result. This is a combination I often use for robot parts, rivets, bolts, that sort of thing. But really, the stuff I do in Creator tends to be the organic stuff. Characters, mostly. Just those rudimentary techniques are enough to sculpt something like this. This is a pitch visual for a mini plastic figurine. You know, the kind of collectible you find in those mystery bags placed at supermarket checkout counters. I used Maverick Renderer for the turntable render on the right, and I did the materials in substance. You can see on the left that I painted parts of my sculpt with that in mind, but more on that a little later. First, let's talk a bit more about sculpting. For this prop, I'm going to start as usual by picking the appropriate primitive shape, then use the manipulators to establish the right base form to build my design on. I'll adjust the grid and angle settings to suit so I can clearly carve out what I need. I know that wedge shape is super simple to do with polygonal tools in a non-VR traditional modeling application. But where I plan to go with this next isn't quite so simple to do, at least not for me. Cutting into it with the Erase tool in a spatial environment makes judging the size and placement of things that much more intuitive. So far, pretty rigid, right? But everything starts off looking awkward and slightly odd. Usually, for me, that's a sign that I'm building a decent foundation for what I want to realize by the end. 
before I start altering the shape, I might mark out some of the cavities, as this will help me keep track of the surface, and when I start to reshape the sculpt, that's going to come in handy. I find the Smooth tool and the Erase tool go hand in hand with the way I work. I will often oscillate between the two tools for more detailed forms. With this prop though, right now I'm trying to get the balance right. The cheese has clearly been sliced off a larger piece, so a lot of it needs to retain the straight edge. But it's also organic, and perhaps been sitting around for a bit. So I'll use the bulge and shrink tools here and there to indicate where it has kind of settled into itself. But it's still got to look appetizing, so it can't look like it's rotten. Plausibly food-like, I guess, even though it's still in such a basic form without any textures or materials on it. Just the overall form should communicate a yummy piece of cheese. Now let's have a go at sketching something a bit more interesting. I'll turn symmetry on, pick my primitive, set my angle and grid, and picture the design I have in my head as a form in the space right in front of me. I'm intentionally avoiding continuous strokes with the clay tool. For now, I just want to block in major forms. Just one clean lump of clay at a time. Then let's grab the move tool and gently adjust the shape towards the specific direction I want the overall silhouette to eventually go. I'm constantly thinking of what's beneath the surface. Imagining the skeletal structure that's holding things up, the masses of flesh and fat that result in the outer layer we're seeing here. At this primitive stage, I avoid the temptation of adding details to any one area. It's really about making large, sweeping changes that define things on a global level like stretches of straight surfaces contrasting with curves and bulges around it. I'm starting to shape a bit of the planes along the top and side of the skull, but keeping things very loose so that all of it advances in detail at the same rate. Thinking about where the weight is, where the forces are pushing or pulling the surface. See what I mean about it looking awkward at the beginning? But, just like carving that slice of cheese, by gradually introducing arrays, smoothing, move and bulge tools, I rapidly arrive at a clear foundation with enough going on and a cohesive level of detail that I can still make major changes to and continue moving forward with the design process. Another really important part is the readability of it all from a graphic design perspective, right? Kind of like a non-destructive workflow. I mean, voxels in general are kind of non-destructive because aside from the undo button, you can just add some more clay if you make a mistake or carve too much out. So you can continuously manipulate your 
grid of voxels, but I like to stay quite disciplined about the levels of detail as I move through the um, design process because I like to make major changes further into the process and then once I'm happy and I can see the vision coming together and that it's going to work in terms of proportions and contrasting shapes and interesting combinations then I start adding in details and more intricacies into the form. All of those are frankly governed by those major forms, right? That's what happens in real life and that's what makes even the most stylized things believable. You know, the thing about sculpting in VR like this is that the mesh topology ends up incredibly dense, like that red wireframe on the left-hand side. The mesh processing tools in Masterpiece can kind of optimize that a fair bit when you export, including remeshing to quads like the blue wireframe. In my experience, that version is more appropriate for animation, whereas the original mesh shown in red is fine for 3D printing, the finished piece you see there on the right. Or even this sculpt of a toy dinosaur. For this one, I worked in three layers so I could preserve those hard edges and defined shapes. I smooth things here and there, but for a cartoony character design, it's important to maintain bold shapes and distinct proportions. So that's how I go about achieving that inside Masterpiece Creator. You'll have noticed I use the paint mode in Creator to block in a simple vertex color palette for that dinosaur. You have the same brush shapes as clay sculpting, sphere, cube, cylinder, and so on. You can even reshape those brush tips using the same manipulators as well. This character here is a boxer for an AR prototype. That's why he's heavily stylized and simplified. The art direction for this project is inspired by Will Vinton's claymation films, as well as the classic Celebrity Deathmatch series on MTV, if anyone remembers that show. I loved that show as a kid. I mean the original Eric Fogel run from the 1990s. Not for the celebrity aspect. I remember digging how wild the animation would get. The extreme fights were just ridiculously fun. Gloriously anarchic for the time, the action had pretty exaggerated animation. This was amidst the era of the early Mortal Kombat games as well, so within that context, what made Celebrity Deathmatch extra fun to watch is because you could see it was hand animated and so over the top and irreverent for its time. In the spirit of, you know, Tom and Jerry or Tex Avery, Celebrity Deathmatch carried that tradition on in the 90s, you know, alongside contemporary itchy and scratchy type segments from The Simpsons. To an impressionable teenager like me, as I was at the time, I got how it was satirical commentary on the obsession with violent sports shows on TV. In hindsight, you could argue it was kind of prescient of the celebrity-focused reality programming that MTV would eventually pivot to not long after. Anyway, the nature of mobile AR right now means that characters, props, and any 3D assets need to be low poly. So even though the mesh of this voxel sculpt will no doubt be super dense, like I showed you earlier with that rodent, by being conscious of the output media this character is intended for, when I sculpted him, I made design choices that I felt would work when I processed and optimized the mesh downsized. And as I place the paint down, I'm conscious of those bold choices I'm making in the art direction. This character clearly needs to pop in his simplified form. And in AR, the readability has to be pretty high as well in terms of your color palette, because it's got to help it stand out within whatever environment the user is uh, experiencing it. This guy's a caricature at the end of the day. So that gives me the opportunity to distort proportions in a way that highlights the role of the character. In his case, he's a boxer. The focus is on his hands. Makes sense, right? That'll also help functionally when he's in situ in the AR app because you want to keep his attacks clear and his hitboxes feeling effective in the gameplay. I'm making use of the brush tips here, the specific shape of it, 
to define certain lines of colour. So I laid the sock down first and then painted the shoe over it. I mean, this is for a prototype, so I can totally get away with this because it's really about selling the concept, landing the overall idea with just enough stylistic cues to get a sense of whether this is going to work creatively, functionally, and as a compelling experience for the target audience. So far, painting in VR is still kind of low res. As you can see, it's kind of, it's quite a jagged edge to that uh, paint there. But I'm sure that's going to get better and better as time goes. But as it stands now, it's still a really handy way for me to uh, create pre art like this, right? For this project, at least, I don't need to do anything more than these really rough vertex color passes on this low poly model, because it's really only ever going to be used as a prototype. But if I did want to take this further, what I've painted here can become a color map to guide me through, you know, something like Substance Painter or in Maya or anything else that I want to work up the model in, because the mesh is still going to be output at whatever res I need it to be, because as you know, it's really dense. But the color map for now can just be a guide for a more complex visualization. In this instance, given the cyclical nature of AR development or even game development, it's more important to keep iterating on the overall concept, not get lost in finessing the design or a specific asset like this. When you know there are many more cycles of development ahead where things are going to change, interactivity will change, character design requirements are therefore going to change. The context of the user's input, the choices they make there, the learnings you get from your prototyping phase are going to inform the design choices you make as well. In fact, as we work through this, I may have to completely change the caricatured look because it may not work as well as I think it's going to work in AR. So all of those things mean that I'm always aware when I'm developing game assets and AR assets, I really need to stay loose and rough and ready because you never know what's going to change and it'll really come down to the wire sometimes. Anyway, the last thing you want is to have spent so long on one aspect that you feel precious about it to the detriment of developing a better experience elsewhere. That's all I'm trying to say. For this early stage, what I have though is perfect. So it's sculpted and painted in Masterpiece Creator and then rigged in Masterpiece Motion and then finally optimized and exported as an FBX file. I bring that here into Tavori, an animation and prototyping app for VR and AR. So in terms of a production process, I'm keeping with the spatial workflow. It makes sense because the output format is going to be spatial. So by staying as much as I can in the spatial paradigm as I'm creating the assets means that I'm always going to be aware of how this is going to be perceived in the output medium. I always say if you can set the table for dinner in the real world, then you know how to lay out a scene in Tavori. I've already set the origin point and checked how my vertex colors look when lit differently within Tavori's settings. The character needs to be easy to read and caricatures can become overly abstract if you're not careful. So it's good to check stuff in context of the lighting and how close or far away you are from the character. So bold exaggeration is kind of the caricaturist's friend, especially for comical stuff like this. Remember, it's in the spirit of Vinton and Vogel stuff, right? And as you can see, I can set the IK settings for the legs and the arms. Working with the skeleton that I created in motion is pretty straightforward in Tavori. You just reach in to the control point and move it into place. Let's see now, what's a good fighting stance? Uh, Let's start with the center of gravity. So I brought his hips down a little bit and then start working out how to distribute his weight. You know, if he's, um, if he's a pro fighter, if he's an experienced boxer, how would he stand? I'd say he's pretty low to the ground, ready to spring up with an uppercut or something. And in motion, the way I skinned the character is, uh, is with this sort of claymation thing in mind. As you can see, Moving his arms and shoulders gives you that slightly rubbery feel to it, which is which is great. And I can imagine if this wasn't going on to AR, 
uh, you could put on a sort of a clay or plasticine based shader um, and uh, really drive home that claymation style. But even then, I think the design choices that we've made and the way I'm going to animate this character in a minute will still be really effective as a mobile AR app in that style. Yeah, that looks about right. That looks like a good um, starting position. With that set, now let's have a look at how uh, we might go about animating it. So I'll definitely want to move the hips to get that bounce. Maybe the shoulder. Yeah, to give a little bit of shoulder movement. And the top. So that would be three controls, three or four controls there. Definitely the hips and the shoulders. And the timeline will look familiar to any animator out there. Pretty straightforward and self-explanatory. The difference with Tavori though is that you can still do your keyframe animation of course but uh, what's unique about doing it in Tavori is you can hit the record button and then manipulate the control point and it will automatically record that movement. So you can very quickly block in your action or in, or in this case kind of go for uh, a performance really, sort of like a puppeted performance. For his hands, I think I'll use both my hands, grab them, and as soon as I move them, it'll start recording the, uh, the movement. Here we go. I can match it to the hip movement I've already captured, scrub it back, and then add a little bit more movement as well. Here we go. Let's grab both wrists and yeah, back and forth. So now I've got the movement from the gloves down to his elbow as well. And here he is, working out inside the ring in our first pass at an AR prototype assembled in Adobe Aero. Even though I used VR production tools to get me here, the requirements of each key step are pretty standard. Sculpt the character in a neutral T-pose, rig and skin him with a fairly standard biped skeleton, animate the moves as different takes or sections of puppeteered frames inside Tavori. Each take is then a different motion set for the character model. You can see my hand movements have naturally added a wobble and randomness here and there. Again, that adds to what we're going for with this concept. VR puppeteering is the right choice. I love how with claymation you can feel the animator's hand at work. They literally leave their mark on every frame. It's nice to be able to bring a bit of that to a CG animated project. Here's an example of a type of project that I don't often get involved in. You see, I'm known for developing cartoons and animated properties for, you know, TV or interactive stuff and VR experiences. I seldom work on VFX as that tends to be hyper real and really is not my bag. And in fact, as a development executive, I don't really get involved uh, with the VFX process that much because that really falls into um, the execution of the piece. My work is usually about um, originating the IP and developing the franchises, very much in the story development side of things. And as I mentioned before, I'm a visual storyteller and I think by creating visuals. So quite naturally, a lot of the um, a lot of the development art that I do uh, stems from what I'm naturally geared towards, which is the very stylized and cartoony stuff. So this project is somewhat of an exception. It's a, it's a sitcom set in outer space uh, with what you could say calls for a sort of stylized realism. That's not the clearest description. Uh, basically, the type of humor and the tone of this property wouldn't work if everything was super realistic with creatures that had very realistic uh, proportions and um, based too closely to you know animals and um, and creatures that we know in the real world. Uh, it, it, we we explored a bunch of things with um, with more sort of um, standard uh, uh, designs and um, and re realistic proportions, and it just didn't carry the humor. So um, that's why uh, I was sort of called in to ideate some stuff on this. And this is, um, this is uh, one of the characters that, um, 
is from the show, but this exact execution um, didn't make, meet the um, um, didn't make the list. So that's why I'm including it here. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> the trick was to find um, an art direction for the creature design that could work alongside the actors plausibly, uh, but um, also land the sort of the physical comedy of this particular show. So when I um, when I approach something that has um, a little bit more realism to it, I mean the principles still apply, right? I'm still thinking of, you know, um, major forms, even though this is um, falling into the fantasy VFX side of things. You know, the principles of shape language and um, leading with the the major forms and getting those in the right place um, uh, is, is still um, is still integral to it. And uh, as you can see here, I've blocked in using this sort of oval shape for most of the shapes there, whether I've sort of layered them on by piece by piece or um, drawn them as a sort of like brush strokes. Um, they all sort of uh, fit together uh, with this sort of overall oval proportions. This, this um, character is, um, is, uh, is a particular uh, species in the show and um, they're known for being uh, sort of a bit sort of um, a bit daft and he's uh, very much a, a lovable goofball so um, the shapes I'm using here kind of reflect that there's nothing hostile about this character they're all very sort of rounded forms but I'm conscious that I don't want to uh, fall into the trap that a lot of VR scops fall into which is sort of a, a blobby sort of um, undefined mess of voxels that's a very easy thing to end up doing because you kind of get caught into the court you kind of get caught up by the pleasure of sort of blending stuff and the magic of sort of you know uh, smoothing stuff stuff around it and sort of all of that sort of thing so I'm, I'm very conscious of that when I uh, when I sculpt and you've seen with my other examples I like um, making the most of those uh, primitive shapes and um, building on them to create sort of these creases and um, and folds in uh, in the characters and adding definition that way so I, I kind of balance um, the smoothness that you get from drawing through the 3d space mm -hmm along with sort of the hard edges you can get by cutting. So over here, uh, just past the muzzle, I'm creating a space for where, um, where the eyes would be. And, and I'm sort of looking at where the brow line might be. So I'm, I'm bringing in touches that are familiar from our universe and the creatures that we know in our world, but I'm trying to take enough liberties so they feel um, that like they belong in something out of this world, um, but also, um, you know, if, were we to, interact with them uh, you know we could we would sort of realize that yes they can exist in our world too it's just that we've never seen anything like this before so you can see there I'm sort of smoothing out the rough edges but I'm being uh, very careful not to lose um, the definition and like all all the stuff that I've been showing you it it always starts off looking a bit um, all over the shop and uh, and uh, sort of abstract and but um, even with them um, cu cutting into it there with the mouth shape I'm using that oval shape but I've squished a little bit more and it might seem like um, you know I'm sticking too much to this sort of shape language into the tools but uh, it works for me you know I um, I feel I feel like everything feels a bit more holistic if I um, if I stick to as few tools as possible and as few shapes as possible and just find um, overlapping and um, overlapping shapes and uh, intersections that kind of work in harmony with each other and I, I find that I can you know track uh, my progress and you know the the unity that I'm going for easier if I um if I if I use one tool one or two tools uh, to to do the major forms you know symmetry helps a lot with uh, with stuff like this because um you know you 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 get everything in sort of the ideal the ideal uh, symmetrical format and then you can turn off symmetry and then make your adjustments to add more um, uh, more personality so the the bumps on his um, sort of muzzle snout thing here it's just using the donut shape and uh, I've done this trick before where you add the uh, bumps on the top and it comes through to the bottom and if I smooth the bottom ones up in a, in a different way to the top one it's a pretty convincing sort of um, shape, uh, shape and detail for the inner mouth, and the top sort of looks like the, um, you know, the outer outer skin, you know, the outer skin of like an alien layer. So I'm thinking of muscle groups and underlying skeleton 
but not overly beholden to it. You know, I've sort of just got the knowledge in my mind. Before I went into um, sculpting this, I was looking at you know photos of hippos and um, and cows. Uh, you know, I was sort of pulling from those sorts of bovine and you know uh, larger uh, mammals, uh, but not trying to make it like it's a sort of a a cut and paste job of those two species. I think it's um, getting inspiration from the way some of those, um, you know, how nature has kind of evolved that particular uh, species into some of the, the choices and some of the solutions it's found for the way they breathe and the way they eat and that sort of thing. So I'm trying to bring in those touches of believability into this character. Something from the script is, um, is um, how they breathe and how they... Uh, here, uh, they've got multiple sort of um, cavities and, and um, uh, you know air holes through their um, through their um, head. So that's what I'm building here. So the, the those side ones are are basically um, um, ears, but sort of inverted. And uh, there's a you know there's a story reason and a very funny um, story point that a recurring gag really. That, um, that happens with, uh, with that, and you can imagine what that's like compared to um, you know, the, the way we're used to hearing. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, the, the smooth tool with the erase tool coming into play there, that's a pretty you know, standard technique of mine. It's a slippery slope because as you can see, some parts of the head there are starting to um, uh, veer very close to um, that sort of that blobby thing that I was talking about. Um, so as I run the smooth tool around here, I'm sort of thinking about the extremes of where the, the flesh and the skin are sort of uh, coming together. So I, I put in the, the smoothing where it kind of makes sense, where the, the forms would blend, but I'm keeping sort of the hard edge and the intersection much more visible in other parts. So it feels like there's um, pieces of flesh coming together. What, what helps here, of course, is that this is a fantasy creature. So I do have some room for, you know, uh, creative license and a, a bit more sort of take some liberties with the, the ana anatomy of it all but it's still got to be recognizable right it can't be so abstract that you can't tell you know head or tail of it here but even at this early stage you know I'm only sort of you know 10-15 minutes into the sculpt and I've pushed and pulled the form all around into a sort of the general um, uh, profile and bust of the character and it's, you know, it's it's reading. It's reading as, as it should. It's got sort of touches of the creatures I've been referring to. And uh, I've, uh, I feel like I've mixed in uh, enough variety, but also um, keeping things uh, looking sort of holistic and, and connected there. He's got quite... Um, large nostrils there and as I've been sculpting this something I didn't think of before I started was you know what's the um, what's the inside of the mouth going to look like how much detail do we want in there so here I'm uh, using the same sort of oval tool and seeing you know can I get away with um, sculpting a shape in there using the same tool for for consistency and sort of a cohesive feel to it but not um, not end up getting too repetitive and this is where, you know, using a combination of just stamping down a clean shape and drawing um, continuously, you know, switching between those appropriately can, can, really help, um, can really help bring that variety. So now that I've seen how big I want the tongue to be in there, it sort of made me think, okay, while I ponder that, I'm just going to go over to this other side and add some more uh, touches that I... Um, that I remember from the from the script. So you know the scent glands, in addition to the to the nostrils that um, he has at the end of his snout, he's also got these other uh, scent glands that are um, uh, much more sort of um, finely attuned to um, to what's going on in the world. And that's another uh, fun thing that um, you know when you come up with these uh, fantastical stories, you can have a ball with uh, with these things, and especially with comedy. You know the slightly absurd and ridiculousness of it all. Um, is uh, is part of the fun, so that's that's one of the reasons why I thought, okay, yeah, I'll um, I'll um, I'll take up uh, I'll take uh, take on this project and see um, see what we get to because it's um, got enough <laughs> leeway 
that um, you know it keeps it interesting and fun without um, getting too bogged down into um, hyper real stuff which as I say is not um, is not my strength and it's always good to play uh, to your strengths know what you're um, what you're uh, really good at and what you um, what you like doing the most you know and, and build on or build on your strengths doesn't mean you can't expand your your palette and this was an opportunity to do that to push me out of my comfort zone and do something a bit more in the realistic space and um, and so far the project's going you know really well even though this one didn't make the cut that's sort of par for the course what's nice about being able to sculpt it in vr is the speed at which you can you can realize one of your ideas is you know if it doesn't work you really haven't lost um, that much time and you can uh, validate your idea spatially in sort of a, a 3d form a close close proxy to what uh, what a you know a finished bust or, or clay sculpture in real life would be which is usually how these things would um, would develop you know you can kind of proof that in advance uh, using VR and, and and realize quite quickly if it's going to um, you know uh, work so even the eyeballs there are um, are sort of these egg shapes and uh, I've been putting off doing the tongue in, in, a, in a section of the mouth as I'm continuing to sort of ponder how exactly I should uh, I should do that so I've um, uh, moved on to you know finishing up some of the detail on on the top and I'm quite happy with the way it's all fit together there and I've got a sense of okay I think I know um, how I'm going to do the tongue in a way that um, feels like it fits into this um, to this creature design it's not something I planned in advance and I and I don't think I sort of remember what tongues look like from my reference material but I'm, I'm giving it a go here and uh, the initial sort of marks there are, you know, not bad. I can see they're sort of intersecting in a way that I, um, I don't like. So I sort of bring in a little bit more of the sort of the, the bulging uh, tool so I can get some of that sort of um, curve on the, um, on the outer edge. So there's like a fuller, sort of fleshier tongue there because it's, um, you know, it's quite, it's quite a large creature, this, this character, as you can imagine, you know, if you think of the source material, large mammals, it's kind of um, based on those. Another thing I try to do is not work in too many layers. Um, I like to sort of keep um, keep moving with a, a, a piece of a single piece of virtual clay. I guess it's you know a discipline that you would um, have to work with with in the real world. You know you'd kind of sculpt with a a big chunk of clay and, and you know manipulate that to get um, get to where you needed to be so it's quite nice to um, put those restrictions on your process so you can um, just uh, just go with it and let the um, let the sculpture kind of tell you what it wants to be you know some of those happy accidents there's nothing wrong with that you know that art is full of those full of those moments you know, everything from whether you're doing a watercolor or um, oil paint or um, you know a charcoal drawing the the, the whole point of it is the the medium kind of has a conversation with you while you're creating. It's giving you feedback um, throughout the creative process, and I, I really think somewhere inside that's that's really what um, what is the most fulfilling part of it. It's it's not so much about the end result, although that is fantastic when you get somewhere where you're really happy with it. But I think the reason I certainly keep coming back to to creating stuff visually is. The, the act of doing it, right, the process itself is, um, is giving me sort of a, a fulfilling feedback loop. And, you know, going back to the whole point of this, um, this talk, you know, doing that in 3D, historically that feedback loop has been sort of a stop-start kind of um, uh, process um, until, of course, I, um, I started exploring these VR tools. And, uh, and now I can sort of get much further along. I have the luxury of not having to create um, final production assets that are going to be used, you know, uh, by multiple people to execute the idea, uh, you know, uh, shot after shot. My stuff is, um, is really a visual aid to the, the, the overall story development process, the IP development and, and you know, the, where the franchise could go, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So um, I'm fortunate that I um, I don't have to have to sort of make it work in a in a production pipeline. But the more I work in these tools, the more I realize that getting to that next stage is probably closer now 
than it ever was before for somebody like me who isn't really the concept artist on a production um, and isn't really the animator or modeler that's going to be doing the um, doing the sort of the main asset for the show. I'm, you know, the, the development executive. So a lot of um, execs don't really have um, the visual ideation process part of their, you know, their workflow. I do. So uh, any sort of new um, ways of uh, expanding that, um, um, that, that ability is, is, uh, is a bonus in, in my book. And this is going beyond sort of like a, like a added value. This is uh, turning into sort of a, a, a pretty standard way of working for me because it's, um, it's, a, it's such an um, effective way of um, validating my ideas and, and um, brainstorming, really. So now I've already moved into um, painting some of the um, some of the key areas, and uh, even though um, I didn't set off thinking I would uh, I would move this into something like substance, I think um, again good part of the art making process is it's you know the art itself if it's if it's going well if the art making is going well it kind of tells you uh, what its potential is you know the direction it can go in and as I've been uh, drawing this and, and painting this. I, um, I can see that uh, there's value in um, taking this beyond just a, a vertex painted sculpt in here that you know you might light with a, a couple of lights just to sort of show off the form and there might be value in taking this a step further and putting some textures on it and some materials to, to uh, visualize things further and, and really explore the, um, the potential of this as uh, the design route for this character. You know, it always starts with story and story and character. Uh, but uh, for my process, it tends to go back and forth with, um, with the writing process and um, the visual ideation process. It's all kind of, it's all writing really, it's all story development. But uh, I might have an idea for a character in a scene and a dynamic between um, uh, the players in a, in a, in a show or a, or a short film. But um, when I start designing them, I then get more story ideas and more insights into who their personalities are. So it's kind of like this circle where your the spark of the character is what kicks things off. But then as you explore the, a design solution and how this character might look as a result of who they are, you know, where they live, you know, what species they are and all of that, and what story um, purpose they have, as you design that visually, then you start getting ideas on who they are and you know where they live and that in, in this design will inform all of that so it's a it's sort of like a, a fun back and forth feedback loop and you know look right here this is uh, what's great about um, being able to do this in the same program that you're sculpting it and doing it spatially just adding those colors there is a sort of a marker for me for um, you know the the personality that I can get across by um, just the just the um, patterns in his skin you know the the sort of the the lip area there making that a different color is sort of like a reminder to sort of say there'll be textures and material work here that's going to um, add a lot of personality to this character same with that sort of um, that um, chubby jaw under you know the sort of the jowls and the and the jaw underneath that's another marker for um, variations in the skin and variations in the material so I'm thinking about all this stuff um, even as I um, as I sort of sketch out this character you know, and working this way, I might do, you know, a dozen or so in a day, exploratory stuff. And that's phenomenal to be able to, you know, get through, you know, a, a dozen or so ideas um, for, for creature design. And that's a whole area that I've, um, I've never really um, gone into. But it's, it's, um, it's certainly getting a bit of an uptick in, in demand, at least the people that I, um, that I work with. So a sketch like that then uh, is progressed into uh, something like this, which is taking that stylized realism really um, a step further. And uh, as I say, you can get through quite a few um, designs very quickly in a day and explore how this um, this notion of a of a space comedy that has uh, very you know fantastical creatures in it. How would that um, how would that work uh, you know visually? 
you can see that those creases I've got there is uh, really a combination of the erase tool, the smooth tool and uh, overlapping shapes. So it's still those same principles but you can get a lot of variety out of it and, um, and a, a sort of consistency uh, across the different creatures. Sort of all, it all fits together quite well. And for look dev, this is some really powerful uh, development work um, to have even before you engage pre-production. Right, so far I've talked about sculpting by stamping primitive shapes and then using the smooth tool to add a degree of complexity on top, maybe blend between those to create some unique shapes, as well as erasing and cutting in details to fine tune your silhouette. Also moving and reshaping the clay, as well as working with various modifiers like inflate and shrink. Another straightforward technique is basically drawing within 3D space, right? Drawing within that cube, dragging whichever tool you've got through the space. And particularly if it's clay, you are laying down clay continuously, or if the clay is already there and you're passing a modifier over it, you are affecting the surface in continuation, obviously. So that technique is clearly handy for stuff like this, like branches or tentacles, that sort of thing. Something to be a bit wary of, something that's still not quite ideal, is how these modifiers get mapped to the trigger button on your controller. I think this is less about software implementation and more about the nature of the control device. You know, pulling the trigger to create marks like this isn't the most intuitive thing from an artist's point of view because your hand is kind of not really gripping the tool the way you're used to gripping, say, uh, a pen or a brush, something that you've used to create other forms of art. This sort of grip around the VR controller is more like a game controller grip and uh, it sometimes feels like you're fully in control and at other times slightly disconnected because of the triggered grip. That said, creating organic forms like this is still pretty speedy and intuitive in VR despite those limitations of the controller's form factor. And that's exactly how I created the horns on top of this character's head. By drawing with the clay tool and then shaping it with the pinch and inflate and shrink tools. I painted the vertexes specifically so I had a color map ready to go in substance. Obviously, it's quicker and more intuitive to paint a 3D model in VR than via a 2D screen. Thinking back to when I sculpted this tortoise, I remember periodically slapping on colour here and there as I tried to figure out where to go with the design. Sometimes blocking in colour helps you see the forms even better than just the uh, blank mesh on its own. And by the time I was happy with the model, those colours that I'd put down were all patchy and in need of tidying up. They were blurring here and there because it wasn't about defining exact areas there. I was sort of exploring the potential of the design as I was still trying to discover the character and the overall form of the matter. This was kind of the first time I'd ever sculpted something quite like this uh, for feature animation. And that's what this, um, this sculpt is for. It's a, essentially a virtual maquette for uh, one of the characters of a, of a feature film. So yeah, by the time I was happy with the, the overall form of the model, those colors were in need of tidying up. Uh, and you know that's important if you want to use a, a color map that you've created in VR at all down the line. It needs to be useful and clean uh, as much as possible. Obviously, we've seen that painting in VR still feels a bit low res, but um, it's still very handy for you know, the broad strokes, the larger areas, defining those so that you can um, at least get a head start as you move through other parts of the pipeline. The low resonance really just comes through on the outer edges of it, on the outer edges of your paint line. Uh, everything else is, you know, very usable indeed. So when you take something like this into substance, really the, the only thing you have to worry about is the transition between one color section and another. You know, um, everything else inside is um, still absolutely fine. 
I guess I should also point out that my experience of using the Paint Tools in Masterpiece doesn't really go beyond the um, the flat brush that we've got here, the sort of the solid color brush. They've got a few different painting brushes, you know, spatter effects and things like that. Um, I pretty much go for a hard edged um, solid paintbrush because um, I just want to block in the colors. I haven't had a use case yet where I want to add special sort of effects and blending uh, with, um, with vertex colors. I've used the odd sort of stamp here and there and a little bit of spattering, but nothing really sophisticated. I so far have really been leveraging the spatial painting um, tools here to very quickly block in colors into areas that would be you know really tricky to get into with um, with the 2d interface if you look at his tummy there obviously the front is pretty straightforward but you can see the colors go round and under and between his um, where his leg enters the shell so those little gaps you know it's hard to see in video form I guess but when you've got a VR headset on and you've got six degrees of freedom with your your head you are you know you are looking into places uh, in a very natural way and can judge distance and scale to a very fine uh, fine point there so um, you know being able to adjust the, the the size of your brush with the thumbstick as you move around spatially with your hand and your head it becomes second nature very quickly and uh, you know I'm a better painter with these uh, virtual characters than I am you know painting a clay model in real life um, it is just obviously a way more forgiving format and um, I'm more relaxed doing it if you've ever tried to paint models in real life it can be quite nerve-wracking because of the permanence of it all at least that's how I feel when I'm um, working with the uh, real sculptures I feel like I am you know uh, risking sort of the point of no return a lot of times with that or at least with uh, with VR I get a bit of that um, the benefits of that kind of interface being able to pick up the object and move it around but then I've got um, all these possibilities in here that um, put me at a little bit more at ease anyway so this is what I'm talking about you know getting under the um, the sort of the, the shell the front soft belly shell area and then blocking it in um, where uh, where it's hard to reach elsewhere. Now I'm only using a handful of colors here uh, because I, as I said before, I want um, a really straightforward clean color map so I can very quickly add materials and textures in um, substance and uh, work up the design to the kind of thing that I, that I need in the final look and feel. I can always finesse the edges and blend stuff in but having it really clean at this point means that when I'm exploring combinations of textures and and combinations of materials, I don't have too many variables to swap around, right? It's about um, the readability of the thing and making overall large changes to see if your design is going to work. So if I find that um, with those large areas, it's still not reading very clearly in substance, I'll come back in here and uh, I'll know that I need to define some more areas, either with the mesh itself or with the paint job, I need to um, add a little bit, bit more detail and um, not decals because it's not a it's not really a, a car, but you know, add zones and areas of interest that are going to be um, important for the for the final look and feel of the character. I can't give away too much about the the plot of the um, the story that this character is in. In fact, I can't tell you much at all but what I can say is this is one of the designs that didn't make the shortlist uh, it's still something that's in development the, the the property is still in development but this is one of the early designs that's why I'm able to share it in um, in this talk I think it makes a good example because it's got the hard shell layering over the the soft underbelly and then the the rest of the um, the body within that so it's kind of like he's got a t-shirt on but um, that also that um, that back as well. So there's a few different layers, but it's not overly complex. That would be um, too too uh, complicated to uh, convey in video form. Because I, I can't I can't stress enough how different it is watching it in video form to um, to experiencing it in VR. So if you haven't given VR painting and VR sculpting a go yet, it's um, it's worth checking out, even if you want to rule it out as something that 
maybe isn't your bag. I know this is a game changer for me because I, um, I've i always found traditional 3D tools too slow and cumbersome to work with and quite frustrating because um, as, a, as an independent, you kind of have to be self-sufficient and the barriers that those have on a technical level can be quite prohibitive to the creative process. You know, you, it, for someone like me, I don't get that creative flow that easily with um, with those tools. If I'm trying to work in 3D, that is. For 2D, I'm very used to the pencil and you know the Cintiq and all that. That's a whole different thing. And I'm using a 2D interface to essentially draw in a 2D medium, even though I'm drawing three-dimensional drawings. At least I always hope they've got dimension to them. But you know, when you're actually working with a dimensional medium like 3D animation and 3D modeling, having this sort of spatial interface is a real liberating thing for someone like me because it's um, lowering those technical barriers and um, uh, opening up that creative flow I was talking about, right? I can, you know, paint something like this in, you know, minutes, whereas it would take me, you know, over an hour to do in, in 2D. And it would be not as an enjoyable process because of the, um, you know, like I say, not as intuitive. Of course, you can do all of this you know, in substance with a Cintiq or, uh, you know, a, a tablet. But I prefer to do this in VR because it's easier to spin the model round and move into those small areas I showed you earlier. And, you know, back, uh, back and forth from details close up and back to the overall design, you know, checking the readability of the design from further away and then jumping in to, uh, to you know, to clarify areas. It just feels like a... Um, smoother process and keeps it fun for longer and uh, you know if you're having fun then you're more likely to stay in the creative zone so anything that makes you more creative is uh, is good in my book and creativity is about having you know it's not about working for a living it's about playing for a living so uh, this is definitely a much more playful way of working with 3d models and uh, vertex painting now even though I am using pretty much just one brush, the sort of the flat color, solid color brush, the, the trigger obviously adjusts the opacity and how far away I, um, I am from the model, the surface of the model uh, will affect sort of like the fall off of it. So even with this single uh, tool, I am getting some subtleties, you know, a, gr a gradual transition from one color to the other. And if I've got the strength turned up, and uh, the sphere smaller I can get what you're seeing there which is a you know a solid block of color with a with a hard edge so there are some subtleties where you know I can just work with one of the brush tips and one of the the tools without having to um, resort to you know the special effects brushes, brushes like the splatter tool and, and blur and all of that stuff and again it's not about you know this being the final uh, model being presented uh, it's um, it's preparing it for the next stage, you know, and making use of the tools for whatever your goals are. I'm sure there's some talented vertex painters out there that um, have a have a different way of working in in VR and and getting much further along the sort of the painting tools. But uh, this is um, this is how I'm using it for this character, because in my mind I've got a goal for um, making sure this fits into. Uh, the production pipeline for the feature film and I know substance is part of it so uh, there's no point in um, trying to work up all the details using you know VR painting tools when um, ultimately it's got to fit into that pipeline so the role of VR here is to prepare the asset as quickly and artist friendly as you can and get it to a, um, a design that is stylistically in keeping with the rest of the production and a mesh that's also versatile it's usable in the pipeline both in terms of the color map and the topology of the mesh itself and you know doing it in t-pose for example so on the right that's my look dev in substance for the feature film version of the character and that same mesh i then optimized and put into unreal to do some look dev for a potential game adaptation of the property and lastly the um, development of a potential toy for the property as well. So earlier 
with the boxer character, I showed you what um, a rig created in Masterpiece Motion uh, allows you to do, especially if you move it into something like Tavori. But you could move it into any other app that supports um, skin meshes and, and basic rigs. Um, now let me show you what it's like to work inside uh, Masterpiece Motion. I'm still, um, still new to this uh, application, but uh, like a lot of things in VR production tools, doing um, something spatially is, um, is a huge relief to someone like me because um, you know rigging can be a very fiddly, uh, finicky and um, highly technical process, uh, especially if you're doing it in um, you know, Blender or Maya or something like that and, um, and only have the, um, the 2D interface with the, the, you know, the manually switching camera angles and all of that sort of stuff. But, um, but the principles still apply here. As you can see, drawing uh, the skeleton, you're kind of um, you know, drawing through the, the center of the model just to define the spine. And as you can see, uh, off the top of the character's head, there's a bone extending out, and that'll help um, deformations and posing outside of it and keeping the mesh integrity intact. So you know, I get those sorts of principles. It's, it's just executing it the traditional way that I find um, uh, really tricky. Um, but um, I can get further along uh, uh, with VR tools for sure. And as you will see in a minute, this, um, this character ends up being a, a pretty versatile asset. And, and as you saw with the boxer character, you know, it's a very serviceable mesh, um, particularly for my line of work because you know, it's all concept development, you know, developing IP. Very few of my assets, other than say the toys and maybe some of my independently released um, uh, films and cartoons, you know, those my assets kind of tend to stay in the previous stage, uh, but more and more with these tools as they mature and I get more familiar with them, I'm getting more confident in using them as um, as final production assets. This um, this Yeti character that I um, that I have here was uh, um, you know I sculpted it in um, Creator, and you can see I've got uh, the vertex painting in there as well. So by now you're pretty familiar with how I um, how I use these tools. So the steps were. You know, simple bold shapes, and then um, you know, reshaping them with some modifiers, and uh, designing it in a T pose because then you can, um, uh, you know, clearly rig things a lot better uh, and and make use of symmetry uh, within the rigging tools. And even with these um, fingers you've got here, I modeled them intentionally, uh, reasonably you know spread out so that um, there was room for all the bones. I sort of planned that ahead, and as you can see there, the splayed fingers have bones extending out of the edge there again that's something that I've learned that you you need to do if you want to you know have a reliably um, uh, manipulable uh, rig and now with one side done I can um, put on the mirror tool line it up with my uh, with my rig um, and again you know I'm doing this spatially so you have to believe me when I say you, you know you really understand where the where everything gets placed because you're just reaching in there and uh, clicking stuff and if you click at the top of a hierarchy, it will duplicate that same hierarchy on the um, on the other side. Um, so uh, it's a really effective way of working. And now I'm just tweaking some of the overlap because I um, I placed the toes, the, the large toes, a little too close together between the two feet. But that's okay. It's something that um, I can adjust. But the bulk of the work um, is kind of done for me because I did one side and I duplicated it. And now I can um, just fine tune the um, the overall rig. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, I don't know how this would um, hold up to your production pipeline or um, you know the standards that you need to meet, uh, meet with. Um, however, you want to, you would use a character rig like this. But for me, you know, the purpose of this um, Yeti character is, um, as you'll see in a minute, is to uh, to see if um, this this property that it relates to can be a um, can be produced with um, transmedia in mind, you know, with multiple formats in mind. Can you uh, create in a way that um, that um, means you have a master asset that doesn't need to be remodeled or re-rigged for every format it goes out into? You know, if you're building franchises today, you uh, you really need to be in multiple touch points and multiple places at the same time. So that's what um, I'm trying to do with um, this character is see if, uh, if I can get a versatile um, character rig and model. As a proof of concept, there he is animated in Maya and rendered in Arnold, and then animated, but then brought into Unreal Engine. 
and lastly animated and then put into Adobe Aero. So that's how versatile um, a model and rig can be. So that's the XR software side of things. Before we get to the Q&A, I think there's just enough time for me to tell you a bit about the VR Inc and how that adds to the way I work. So that's more of the hardware side of things. VR Inc is basically a first generation VR stylus made by Logitech. It's a Steam VR compatible device that works with the Vive, the Vario and the Index headsets. And it's tracked via base stations in your room. So basically it relies on uh, outside in tracking and, um, and the device is shaped in a way, if you can see that it's a, it looks like a con conventional pen on one end and the other end has got that sort of loop shape. Um, that's uh, to help sort of track its orientation. Um, apparently there are uh, future versions uh, in the works that are addressing the sort of the, the, that sort of protruding shape there. But even still at this early stage, it's pretty, uh, pretty cool that you have a, a, a sort of a pen shaped device that can be tracked uh, with six degrees of freedom and it can work alongside your, uh, your existing controllers. Or if you had a couple of them, I guess you could um, use them both. But hopefully um, you'll see in a minute when I take you through how um, I use it, you hopefully get a sense that there's a benefit to combining it with um, existing VR controllers. So I'm using it with the, the Vive Pro and the intended USP is immediately apparent from looking at its form factor. When it was first revealed last year, I was kind of skeptical. Would it really be that different in practice? And then when I finally got my hands on it and started using it, I was interested to see if it might help unlock more flow in my creative work. And by that, I mean my ideation process with spatial design apps that we've been looking at. As a consultant, I often lead the visual narrative for productions in various formats and uh, you know, for animated properties, picture books and so on. Historically, I've always drawn my characters by hand on paper or in the Cintiq and the more digital apps that I work with, I, um, I still find drawing uh, uh, creeps in pretty regularly in my process. In fact, it's a, it's a pretty constant presence. You know, drawing to me is a visceral act, right? It's a it's a physical interaction with your creation, you know. And and for, as someone who's drawn, you know, his entire life, it feels like a very natural extension of my thought process and uh, and uh, a, a way of uh, problem solving uh, visually that leads to story ideas and character ideas that um, I uh, I wouldn't be able to get to any other way. So whether I'm developing a, a new property or designing for an existing story. I iterate from loose sketches of an idea to a clearer design statement of the visual concept. And eventually a reference visual to direct the final production or execution. Essentially, as I said before, I think by drawing. I've been working like that for you know, my entire career. You know, but, uh, but as you've seen in recent years, creating in VR has been uh, sort of something that's gradually become an in integral part of my workflow. And as my approach is more artistic than uh, technical, I really value how liberating good spatial UX can be. And from the examples we looked at before, uh, it's, uh, it has tremendous potential to uh, open up new avenues for, for artists. But regardless of the output format, visualizing CG content in VR has helped me so much that it's safe to say I've embraced XR spatial design as part of my storytelling and visual development practice. And that said, as much as I may sound evangelical uh, about this, it hasn't stopped me from questioning our expectations of creating through XR and the boundaries that we may already have imposed on our XR native uh, content making process. So this infographic by Metanaut VR says it best. To me, as a user, all the VR controllers feel like the descendants of game controllers. You grip them the same way as you would, you know, an Xbox controller or a PlayStation controller. The lineage is all over the button arrangement. Even cut in half and placed in each hand, it can at times feel like I'm guiding things. I, I mentioned this earlier about the feeling of piloting things, you know, a couple of steps removed despite being immersed. And I think it's 
because of this uh, control scheme of a joystick and trigger. Now, I guess if you uh, if you if you're someone who's always um, used creative apps that you know sometimes get released on 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 uh, games machines like Dreams or whatever, then I guess this would feel natural to you. But uh, to me, you know, uh, these game controllers are kind of associated with entertainment and interactivity uh, without um, the kind of the precision and natural feel that I expect from my art tools. At least that's my sort of creative, uh, uh, creative upbringing. Uh, and this sort of mirrored symmetrical design makes sense as a multi-purpose interface, you know, because you want to have controllers that can be held in the left or the right hand and swapped over and it, it all be sort of balanced. And that makes perfect sense if you are trying to, uh, you know, tick multiple boxes, you know, it's got to be a game controller and uh, a presentation controller and, uh, you know, some, uh, multiple um, VR formats and all that. But the best ones are, you know, admittedly remarkably effective if you're looking for a jack of all. This notion of a pen style grip that you, you know, with the, with the stylus versus a gaming style grip is something we'll come back to a couple of times. But first, let me tell you about some of my use cases that I've been exploring with, uh, with the VR Inc. The focus of this part of the session is to share my experience of mixing Vive controllers with Logitech's VR Inc. stylus to create a natural spatial design experience for ideation and visual storytelling workflows. When I say natural, I mean natural to me, obviously. As you see, my workflows involve any combination of these apps and not limited to them, frankly, but you know, all the, the choices that I make are driven by the storytelling requirements. Depends on what I feel is needed narratively and stylistically, what the project essentially calls for and the, and the pipelines I need to keep in mind if indeed uh, I'm developing something that goes beyond the concept stage, or at least uh, has the potential to move beyond that initial ideation and story exploration stage. Most of my work is developmental work that doesn't have a life beyond the sort of the pre-pre-production stage, but sometimes it does happen. So that goes into um, you know the choice I make on what, what I'm using at the time. And Logitech have said that the VR Inc is software agnostic. Uh, it, it is supported by a dozen or so VR apps. Some of those are sort of CAD drawing tools that aren't really my bag. Um, but out of the ones I do use, so far, these three have implemented support. Um, Tilt Brush, Gravity Sketch, and Flying Shapes. I hear from the Masterpiece team that uh, uh, support for VR Inc is, uh, is planned for a, a future update. So uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be going back to, um, going back to uh, them about uh, my discoveries here and see if, uh, See, see if there's something they can do with the sculpting side of things. Because I can imagine, uh, you know, uh, having a pen-like and you know stylus-like shape could be uh, could be a cool way to add um, uh, add details and control to the the sculpting workflow. And then who knows, maybe even the the motion uh, rigging process, you know, uh, it might be additive to that. In any event, I hope uh, more apps uh, will follow support for the VR Ink because even uh, this early on. I think it's a, it's a pretty promising device. So drawing spatially in XR was always cool. You know, a, a stylus shaped controller makes it all the more intuitive for me. For some reason, it improves my focus on the spatial drawing. The placement of the pressure sensitive button on VR ring, which is towards the tip there, and the way I hold it feels very familiar to how I draw with a pencil. You know, I've got sort of my three fingers around it and uh, you know, the index finger is just above that button. So I instinctively take the act of drawing in VR more seriously. And, you know, sketching characters and uh, you know, working, the, working through the, the contours of the, of the design it just feels like uh, familiar territory to me, even though I'm doing it spatially with a brand new device. And through my line work, I can sense the forms better and can sort of translate my 2D process into 3D with uh, a little less friction. You get a uniquely versatile drawing, a hand-drawn 3D sketch viewable from any angle, obviously. And that's really important to designers to maintain a clear silhouette and a strong graphic statement. With this, you know, in these examples, the artist's hand, their style, 
is also intact with this spatial line work. A tailored control scheme like this starts to enhance things much more by leveraging decades of drawing in real life. Humans have been drawing and painting for 40,000 years. It's one of the oldest forms of communication. With something as refined as art and design, why wouldn't you want to make use of the muscle memory you have from working with analog tools, if indeed that is your background? So that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, this is uh, development art for an animated series Bible. Uh, a series Bible, if you're not familiar, uh, presents the vision, world building, tone and key characters every animated series needs one to sell the idea to commissioners. Artwork is obviously a big part of that. And the design of VR Inc. answers the need for a simple tool, a natural extension of the hand that offers familiarity and precision. And here is a sketch I, I did in Gravity, Gravity Sketch, spatially. And it's a, it's a creature inside uh, his, uh, his uh, UFO. And um, that sort of spatial sketch is my guide uh, to building the 3D forms also in Gravity Sketch. So whilst it's a loose sketch to begin with, it's, uh, it ends up being something of a, of a blueprint for hard surface modeling like this, done with uh, a mix of nerves modeling and uh, polygonal uh, modeling. And by having my drawing nearby at all times, spatially, I. Uh, I find it easier to recreate my character's personality and uh, unique silhouette in, um, in 3D, which uh, I've struggled with before because, um, you know, it's hard to interpret 2D drawings into, uh, into 3D, especially if you're, uh, if you're not working spatially as the old tools used to be. But uh, with, with these tools now, you're sort of um, closing the gap a little bit, right? You've got your line work done spatially, uh, which ends up being a, a really handy uh, reference point when you uh, work on the surface and, and contours of the of the model itself. And this is subdivisional modeling in um, Gravity Sketch. Here, I'm visualizing a production asset for a location-based VR experience. You know, I. Uh, I draw with you know a line sketch on a on a two D plane, and it's important to know that that white plane is aligned with um, a tabletop in the real world. So I've set up a drawing surface in VR that um, gives me the resistance of the physical uh, surface in the real world, and so drawing a line on that surface uh, also gets projected on that um, vertical uh, ninety degree uh, line uh, at the end there. So this way, I enjoy the familiarity of sketching on a tablet or a, or a you know, hard surface and simultaneously uh, having the ability to create the work in 3D space and you know, pull, the, pull the points out. So this is really um, helping me cross that divide because I can keep track of the 2D aspect of it, the graphical statement, uh, and also see how it affects the um, 3D uh, shapes and vice versa. And this is a this is a really great feature in in flying shapes. I hope more VR apps um, uh, implement something like this. But that you know the the stylus really comes into its own here, the VR ink, because uh, you know you're swapping between that 2D interface, even though you're uh, working spatially, uh, you're you're getting the best of both worlds there. And uh, this is where that precision uh, really starts to. Um, uh, come into its own. This app was kind of designed with um, product uh, product designers and automobile designers in mind, but um, I find it's quite helpful for uh, you know hard surface modeling and uh, and you know cityscapes and stuff like that, roughing stuff in. If you've got um, if you've got an idea of how it might work from a 2D perspective, uh, building out the form in, uh, in 3D uh, is a, it's a pretty, um, pretty nice process. And so that way, I modeled, uh, I modeled this car based on a, a drawing uh, for that uh, location-based experience. And I can flip between the different views on the 2D surface, because it's got sort of like an orthographic view panel on the right. I can flip between and, and get by different views and see how that 
works in the in the grand scheme of things for the sci-fi art direction of the piece and then at any point i can sort of look over to the uh the the car in the space and walk around and get a sense of what that's like i'm essentially drawing freely within vr either with the physical feedback from a 2d surface in real life or in room scale 6 off 3d oscillating between the two on the fly allows me to explore the possibilities of 3d modeling in a way that um, i'm already used to working so this as i say is bridging the gap uh, i'm uh, you know i'm getting results like this just two weeks in to uh, to working with the vr rink and i feel this combination helps me better understand how my lines and shapes will interlock in the final form it leads to sort of clearer communication in production meetings as well and that's the whole point of development visuals like this so working this way i advance through my familiar stages of drawing but in a new workflow searching sketches become flowing organic lines that lead to smooth curved surfaces of you know 3d forms here using the revolve tool and uh, the nerves surfacing modeling tools in gravity sketch i'm creating bottles and it may not sound like uh, that exciting but you know it's uh, it's intuitive and it's fun and uh, it's a it's a really quick way of understanding the proportions and scale of the senior building even when it's something as uh, as simple as, as props like that and then you know when you want to do a more sort of customized surface starting off with uh, drawing those lines with your dominant hand in my case my right hand you know leading with that I draw my contour lines and then uh, create a surface over the top so this is a uh, this is a pretty cool way of getting uh, you know 3d surfaces organic uh, hard surfaces uh, to work in your um, in, in your in your designs and uh, as I say, that drawing hand uh, feels, like a, feels like a natural extension of your thought process if you've been used to using um, similarly shaped uh, uh, art tools. So now to create the surface of this book, I, uh, I've essentially drawn the, the lines of the contours of the book, the outside of the book, and then created the, the cover there. This is look dev for a live action production. You know, look dev in production design essentially provides directorial reference to various departments, props, location, set dressing, uh, you know, the DOP, art department, etc. It also helps sell in the vision to stakeholders like the head of the studio. And this was for a, a clearly a children's uh, program about, uh, about witches. When creating these surfaces with VR ink and a Vive controller, my drawing hand still leads. Using asymmetric VR controllers opens the door for the dexterity I'm used to in other mediums. The VR ink is just another in a long line of drawing tools I operate with my right hand. That's a bit of my drawing legacy there. And, you know, I still use all these tools depending on what I'm doing. So it kind of fits in to, my, to the way I work with my right hand. And my left hand has always handled multi-purpose duties. So the Vive controller feels right at home there. And in this setup, being a jack of all trades is the perfect support for the more focused, specialized tool. These are stills from the scene layout of an animated story for VR called Four Seasons of Isolation. You know, painting snow in the corners and the roof and the windowsill uh, might seem like a, a simple or boring act, but the presence in VR has always been sort of a, a way to, you know, a, a beeline to empathy for the creator as much as the viewer. So here in Tilt Brush, rotating the canvas with my Vive hand um, and then painting the snow on with my uh, drawing hand, it kind of feels like I'm icing a cake in a, in a, in a funny way. So who is this for? You know, if you're looking to feed your creativity, if you're curious about reinvigorating your approach to visualizing in VR, if you're, you know, if you can sense the benefits of traversing the analog, digital, and virtual realities of creating, and if you're in the habit of expanding your practice through the exploration of different mediums, then, you know, this is a really exciting development and hopefully a sign of uh, more to come. It hasn't changed the output 
so much as transformed how it feels when I'm creating. You know, we talk about the power of XR to connect us with virtual space and the spatial art that we're uh, making. Well, working this way, I undoubtedly have a stronger bond with my creation. It feels like a completely new workflow in, in places, but also oddly familiar. This 2D, 3D hybrid approach has lots of potential. It's awakened the possibilities of seeing the XR UX afresh. And I hope this is the start of many more bespoke input devices. Thanks very much.